we will read 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds you are healed. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your souls. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to sing praises to you, to hear your words spoken. Lord, we are thankful that we can come to you in prayer, and we are thankful that you listen and that you answer those prayers. Lord, we are thankful that you had enough love for us, that you sent your Son to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, we're thankful for the salvation of God <coughs> through the shed blood of Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will be with each and every one here today. If there's someone who does not know you personally, we pray that what is said and done here today will touch their hearts and open the pathway so they may know you. Lord, we pray that you be with Pastor Rex this morning as he comes to deliver the message. We ask that you be with anyone who is suffering uh, from any kind of illness. We ask that you be with Walter. We thank you for the healing and his progress so far. And we pray that you will touch him with your healing hand so that he may return to your service here. Lord, we pray that you will be with those traveling. Keep them safe. Return them to us. Be with us throughout this week. And we ask this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> Many years ago, I came to this church as their youth pastor back in 72, 1972, a century ago. And uh, when I did, I was, I was uh, looking for a job, and uh, I had to have support, basically. And so one of, the, one of the career opportunities that opened up to me was substitute teaching. How many have substitute taught? Okay. You know what I'm going to talk about. You know, the first week went fine. But then I got into this one class. It was a shop class at Airport High School. And I don't know, they must teach them different at Airport. Sorry, all you Airport people. But uh, I, I started the class, I took attendance, and then I said, okay, you're dismissed to go and work on your projects. And go on. Well, five minutes later, I look up into the shop room, and they're all gone. Every student, I said, what happened? Couldn't have been a partial rapture. <laughs> and so I, the next day I came to school, and uh, I had the whole week there at that school. I said, what happened to all you students? Oh, we had emergencies and things like that. I said, well, uh, <clears throat> what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take the attendance at the end of the class. And if you're not here... Your teacher will know about it. Guess what? It was 100%. And I'll be back and then check them all off. Boy, wrecked their little fun. <laughs> but the worst class, though, was the uh, accelerated English class at Cantrick Junior High. <laughs> I don't know what they were accelerating. <laughs> They made the best planes you could ever imagine. I wrote everything they needed to do on the chalkboard, you know, all the assignments. And one after another, five minutes into the class, they come up and say, we're done and we're bored. I said, well, I know you're accelerating, but let me see your work. And they showed me the work and everything. I said, well, then it's free time. I should have done this. <laughs> Within about 15 minutes, the principal came in. And... Uh, I thought I was in trouble, but they were in more trouble, okay? So they had to sit back down and no more free time for that. But what a job that is, being a substitute. You know, that's what our message is about. Jesus, and we're going to hold on to him. He's our substitute. He filled a role in our life that we could not fill for ourselves. He did something for us that we could not do ourselves. And he became our substitute. And he went to that cross. And he, he, as it says in the text, he bore or carried our burden of sin and the guilt of sin. And he did that for you and I. Now, how did all that take place? Well, 
there's much precedent for the role of a substitute, and it's found in Isaiah 53. But we're not going to look at that because we really don't have to. All we have to do is look at the passage that we have and move up two verses to verse 22. And verses 22 through 25 repeat much of what happened in Isaiah 53, or the suffering Messiah. It says, He never sinned, nor even deceived anyone. He never sinned. Isaiah 53, 9 says, He had done no wrong. So our substitute was perfect. And he qualified to be the perfect substitute on our behalf. Isaiah 53, 1 Peter 3, 22. And there's verse 24 said, He personally <coughs> carried our sins in his body on the cross. Isaiah 53, verses 4 through and 5 and verse 12 says this, Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows he carried. He was wounded and crushed for our sins. Isaiah 53, 5. And then Isaiah 53, 12. He exposed himself to death. Counted among those who were sinners. He bore the sins of many and interceded for sinners. And then verse 25, Isaiah 53, 6, very familiar phrase. All of us have strayed away like sheep. Once you were like sheep, you were away. We left God's path to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the guilt and sin of us all. He became our substitute. And so today we have uh, in Jesus a substitute. He filled that role for us. He did what we couldn't do for ourselves. And, and the, the word there that says he bore means to carry as our sin bearer. And that's what he basically did. And it's not as though all the sin of the world was uh, heaped upon him. But the guilt of that sin was. The penalty of that sin was given to Jesus Christ. And he took that as our substitute and paid every part of it. So the next time you sense the accuser abusing you with the guilt of your sin, you say, wait a minute. That's something my substitute took care of. And he took care of all of it. Not one bit. Now, I know some cults say that, he, yes, he did die for sin, but not all of sin. And I've yet to hear them say which part of our sin he didn't cover. But according to scripture, it says he carried it all. He bore it all. He became our sin bearer. And so as the enemy, the great accuser of your soul, begins to work you over again, you just cry out, my substitute paid it all. He became my sin bearer. And he took those sins to the cross the penalty of that sin, and paid it all. So, only in Christ can we have a sin bearer because we're qualified. He was perfectly willing. He had the ability to do it for all because he was perfect. <laughs> and it only happened once. He only paid that price once as opposed to a system that had daily sacrifices going on. The smoke from the burnt offering was continually going up into the sky, but not when Jesus Christ came to heaven for our sins. It happened once. Once for all time, for all men, for all sin. He paid the penalty. So, only Christ, the sinless Son of God, could he bear our sins. He became a curse for us, according to Galatians 3.13. It says, anyone that hangs on a cross becomes a curse. And he did. He hung upon that tree. A mark of shame took that curse, became the substitute for us. We deserve that cross. We deserve to die for our sins. For all of us have sinned. See, the Bible says that all are guilty. All. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, today, when you go to court, you're considered innocent 
until proven guilty. In the court of God's judgment, <laughs> all are guilty. There's only one innocent, and that is his son, Jesus Christ, who shares his righteousness and innocence with those who believe in him. And they receive his righteousness. The death penalty should be imposed on all of us, no matter what degree of sinner you are, because it doesn't matter. For all have sinned. We were just in the book of Galatians today in Sunday school, and we were with James, and we, we saw that uh, when you sinned and uh, fell short in one area, you're guilty of all, all the law. So that's not fair. Well, that's just the nature of things. We have a fallen nature, and when that nature expresses itself, it just reveals that we are completely, totally depraved and sinful. Except my wife. <laughs> Sweet. All has sinned. Death penalty should be imposed on all of us, but because of our substitute, that penalty has been paid for completely. Hebrews 9 26 says this Jesus is God's provision for the sin issue. He came once for all at the end of the age to put away the power of sin forever by dying for us. <coughs> He was, that, as John saw him coming down that bank to be baptized, he is the spotless Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Hebrews 9.28 says, Christ only died once as an offering for sin. For all people, he would come again, but not to deal with our sins. And that's great news, isn't it, when he comes again. Hebrews 10.10, under this new plan, we have been forgiven and made clean by Christ dying for us once and for all. It only took one penalty, the payment of one penalty on Jesus' part, and he took care of all sin for all time. He died on the cross in our place to pay the penalty for our sin. Those sins are covered completely and fully paid for. 1 John 1 7 says, For the blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Aren't you glad you have a substitute this morning? Amen. I'm glad you, aren't you glad you don't have to pay for part of your sin? Because according to Galatians, according to the law, you sin partly, you're guilty of it all. And so you get the, the full punishment. But because of our substitute, Jesus bore it all became our sin bearer for you and for me. And, and you notice in that verse 24, it said there's a purpose in this. There's a reason for this. Not only his great love, we know that. He also loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. We know that. And uh, Romans 5, 8, that God demonstrated his love towards you in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So we know his motivation is love. But he had a purpose for you. And we see that it expressed in verse 24. It says that I might die to sin. And they said, what do you mean by that? Well, he did this because when he died and when we received Christ, something very supernatural took place. We were placed, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, into the body of Christ, and Christ was placed into us. <laughs> In, in Romans 6, it describes it as the great baptism. The baptism that took place. You and Christ were joined together and placed into that water and then raised to new life. Now, what happened at that moment? Well, your sin nature was rendered powerless. Now, for those of us that had uh, used our sin natures up on that thing, uh, you know, we know that 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 sin nature can be overpowering. And you know that when you had uh, come against something that you knew you shouldn't do, the power of that lower nature and the, the persuasiveness of that sin uh, and the allurement just drew you into it almost, almost without your consent. And, and, uh, and then it would enslave us. And so... So that when we came against those same circumstances again, we just naturally fell into the groove of sinning. 
That's why we call ourselves <laughs> sinners saved by grace, because one thing we accomplished quite well, we learned how to sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Well, at that point, when we were placed in the body of Christ, uh, he rendered our sin nature powerless. He didn't exterminate it. That will take place when you get your new body in Christ. When you ask in this world or during the rapture, then it will become extinct. But for now, it's dormant until you choose, you choose to resurrect it again. And, and you do that by saying, I think I'm going to do it. And boy, that lower nature just comes alive and it comes through and with full force in that sin. And, uh, but he said, he came, that we might die to sin. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that when sin crosses our path and we have that opportunity, we're as unresponsive to that sin as a dead person. Now, uh, recently I saw on the History Channel they uh, raised this one guy who thought uh, who was part of the Great Escape from Alcatraz Island. Anybody see that? Well, when they got his corpse up after being buried 60 years, he didn't look too fresh or too good. <laughs> so the next time you watch Bones, Eunice, Remember how they reacted. They all hit the deck and grabbed their nose. Even after 60 years, you know. But he didn't look too fresh. And you know what? If you flashed a sin before him, I'm sure that corpse would remain dead as could be in that car. Well, that's exactly what God wants us to do when sin crosses our path. When we sense that allurement, that attraction, when we sense that 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 fight or that uh, desire to defend our rights. That we just act as dead men. Unresponsive. Unresponsive to it. That's what he wants us to do. How's it possible? Well, we know it's difficult. Because in Romans 7.15, Paul said this. The things I would do, and the things that I don't want to do, I hate because I do them anyhow. And so that war against that Lord nature is great. And so we have to we have to do the biblical formula and just say, Lord, I know it's dead because you're my substitute and rendered my lower nature powerless. So therefore, I'd rather do what you would have me do than what my lower nature would have me do and the trouble I would get into. So we choose right over wrong. We choose it. We make the choice. And, and there, there came a time in my life where I just, I got tired of being miserable in my sin. Even after I became a Christian, I was still, it, it happened occasionally. More than I want to admit. But, but there, so he makes us tired. And makes us unresponsive to when we yield to him. And, and it happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. Don't try it on your own. Say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me to be like a dead man when sin floats my way. Just, just non-responsive, unresponsive to that sin. Is it possible? Yes, it is. Because that's why he died for us and became our substitute, so that we might die to sin. Well, then he also said just, just the opposite, that we might live to righteousness. You know, before you became a Christian, the right you tried to do always ended up wrong, at least in my case. Anything I tried to do through a, a New Year's resolution or just try with all my mind. Always ended it in chaos because you cannot do it yourself. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, when He infuses you with His power, He also activates that, that new nature, that righteousness of Jesus that He's placed in you. In other words, until you come to Christ, you don't have too many alternatives. You just sin naturally. But when Christ comes into your life, he puts to death or renders that lower nature powerless and then puts a whole new set of alternatives in your life so that you follow him and live to righteousness instead of doing the same old thing over and over again. You know what I mean? Amen. Okay. Well, Pastor Rui and I know what we mean. <laughs> Same bars. <laughs> okay. So that's what he does. That was the purpose of him being your substitute. That you might die to sin, and that you might live to righteousness. Do the right thing instead of keeping doing the wrong thing. Now, the reason I'm so 
passionate about it is because it took me years. It still takes me time and a struggle in that lower nature, that battle of the flesh. And, and, and yet, you can come out victorious. And oh, when you do the right thing, it's so sweet. Because you know you didn't do it. You know your substitute was there helping you all the way. Well then, verse 25 is a conditional action that the Holy Spirit takes inside of you. And that is, he brings healing, healing to us. Now what does this all mean? I don't have time to explain it. Wow, I really don't have time. But let me tell you this. When he starts healing us, from that sin nature and the consequences of sin, oh, it opens up a whole new vista of life inside us. I mean, we're healed spiritually, become alive spiritually. That's enough in itself. But I believe it affects every area of our life. Until we get to heaven, we won't know the damage that our lower nature did and that we did to ourselves. It will be revealed to us. It'll wipe away our tears and then we'll go on into eternity. But we... Sometimes we're our worst enemy. But what we've done, and we need healing. And it says, by his scourging, by his stripes, we are healed. Spiritually, we come alive, and then it, it can help us overflow into our physical lives too. So I believe in the healing power of Jesus Christ. He can heal those memories of things that took place years and years ago that seemed like they happened yesterday. You know, and, and, and if you know what I mean, it's because the enemy keeps trying to replay those tapes over and over again to, to hold you into bondage and, and to control you. But he can heal that. He can heal that. You can reverse those things. You can put your race and uh, get rid of that server you have in your basement. <laughs> <laughs> that was a political joke. <laughs> I raised 2,000 things. I mean, no. You don't have to do that. The Holy Spirit will do a better job than you could ever do with taking care. Because he promises healing. Do you want his healing this morning? Your substitute wants to heal you. Heal your memories. Heal your scars. Heal, to, to take care of you. To help you in those some of those dysfunctional areas that you might have. Some of those things that inhibit you. He wants to take care of all of and I believe he can. In Christ, we potentially have power unlimited. That's what he said to his disciples. They were just ordinary people, but he said, uh, well, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you shall be, not just act, but you shall be my witnesses. So we need his healing. Call out to your substitute. Say, thank you. You're my sin bearer. They're gone. They're forgiven. I'm, I'm a new person in Jesus. But thank you also for the healing that comes. And then the last thing is we need our shepherd. We need him to lead us. So all we like sheep have gone astray. You know, as, as sheep, they go in all kinds of directions. And, and uh, <clears throat> if you've ever seen a flock, or if you've ever been a shepherd, ask John. He's, he's got some goats. And sheep? I can't remember that. But anyhow, uh, it's an apt description of our role or nature. And so we need him. And it says he's the shepherd and the guardian of our soul. So he puts that guard up. And if we allow him, things that we would fall naturally to, or lower naturally to, he helps us to resist. He helps us. He leads us. He guards us. He guides us. And he tirelessly looks after us and, and helps us and protects us. He knows us. So whenever trials and difficulties come our way, the shepherd knows us. He oversees us. He protects us. He seals us and our souls for eternity. Well, so what's the bottom line? When we approach this table, we're approaching the symbols of the substitute, his blood and body. And, and he did that. And, and he did it for you and me out of love. So it would have results in our lives. So that we would be dead to sin. So that we would receive that righteous nature so we do the right thing. And then so that we would be healed and have a shepherd in our lives, guiding us Garden us all the way. <coughs> Fire your heads and your eyes and your smile.
You've never received him, just call upon your substitute and he'll apply all that he did at Calvary on your behalf. And you can claim forgiveness and eternal life forever. Father, thank you for the simple plan of salvation. Thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus, for being our substitute. You willingly and you uh, chose to do that for us out of your tremendous love. And we'll spend eternity thanking you for it. Now, Father, as we partake in, in this communion, this, this, this uh, ceremony, just to celebrate you, celebrate your blood in your body, we thank you that we can rejoice as a body of believers together for all that you've accomplished. But we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.